in New York City this week. Isn't that amazing? And we, we know that judgments are coming. There's judgments coming. When you see it, you know it's judgments. It's not anything but that. They had, a, what, eight inches of rain within two hours. The, the people were just, it's just terrible. It's terrible. They're, I saw them shopping in a grocery store, and the water was up to the produce. And the cars, the waters are up to the windows and the vehicles, and, and it's just... It, it's just the most amazing thing. They said the last time this happened, of course, you know, it's, it's climate change is what's causing it, of course. Um, climate change is just another word for judgment. They just don't understand that. But the last time this happened was in 1948, which is just really bizarre. The year that Israel became a nation, this happened. So it's, I, I, this God's involved in this, isn't this is just amazing. But there's a lot of believers I know in, in New York that are being affected too. And, and we pray that God would just give them wisdom to know what to do in this situation. Um, <clears throat> this situation. Is, this is a lot. So this took me, I wrote this sermon, tore it clear out because I was mad at it. And I rewrote, this sermon took me two weeks to write. And so I just, I, I just really, <clears throat> it says a lot, and I got a long way to go, so I need to quit babbling. This is called The Seen Sins, Jeremiah 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. Jeremiah is speaking prophetically the voice of God. And so it's God speaking here. When you read this in Jeremiah, he says, because he's saying, I, the Lord, search. So this is God speaking the whole thing. And God says the heart is deceitful. Now he's talking about the heart of every human being. Your heart, my heart, the hearts of every believer and non-believer. God says the heart is deceitful. The heart is the Hebrew word labe. It's the mind, the will, and the feelings. How many have deceitful feelings sometimes? The way that you personally think and understand and reason. It's the things that make sense to your soul. He says the heart is deceitful. It's that soul. It's the, it's the akabe. It's been polluted by a multitude of influences. God says that it's feeble and it's frail and it's incurable and you have no ability to figure it out. How many know that you will struggle with your soul till you take your last breath on this earth? It's made to be that way. God made it to be that way. How many are thankful for a built-in enemy? Then God declares here in verse 10, I, the Lord, penetrate and I examine your soul. And this is what he's saying. You ready? I put your soul to the test in order to give you that which is according to your potential. While you're here on earth, God is testing your soul to see what your potential is. Look what Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10 and 13. There's therefore no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you're able, but will with a temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. One of the things you need to pray daily, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So you need the will of God done on earth as it is in heaven in your life. And then you need to pray, uh, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. That is something Jesus taught you to pray, and you should be praying it every day. Lead me not into temptation, but deliver me from evil. <clears throat> Paul uh, has told us this verse in 1 Corinthians 10. Now, I've heard this verse preached multiple times, but this is one of those verses that lack understanding, that you're not really sure what it means. We usually hear it, if somebody has a like somebody dies in their family and they say, well, God won't let you be tempted beyond what you're able to stand. How many have heard people say that? Yeah. That's not what it's talking about. It's what we like to think it's talking about. And it's what preachers have told us. But it's a lack of understanding this scripture. He says, there is no temptation. The word is pyrasmos. It means you will never be enticed in order to be examined, test, or proven. 
God will not allow you to be enticed or tested beyond what you are able to, to bear in this life. God knows how much you can take in the tests that he's going to put you in. And there's more to it than just somebody dying and, and now I can, you know, I have grace to get through it. As a believer, every situation that you encounter was designed specifically to test you and to prove you. Every situation that you've encountered in your life, it was designed for you, specifically. Why? Because God has an eternal kingdom and he's interviewing for eternal positions. You've got to understand that. Everything that you go through, it's for an eternal position. You are being tested for an eternal position. How many get that? In Matthew 5, Jesus says that there will be those who will be great in the kingdom, and there will be those who will be least in the kingdom. When you think of that, it's hard to imagine what that is. But it must be really important. Great in the kingdom must be way better than you ever imagined. And least in the kingdom must be way less than you ever imagined. That's why all these tests matter. On Judgment Day, each person who enters the kingdom of God will be given a position of rank. Look what Jesus said in Revelation 22, 12. Behold, I come quickly, my reward is with me to give every man according to as his work shall be. How many see that? It's mistranslated in most translations. I don't know if you have one of those off translations, like the nearly inspired version or one of those. But many of them say, according to what he has done. But that's not what the original said. It's a mistranslation because Christianity doesn't understand the ways of God in the kingdom. The way of your soul has everything to do with your eternal reward. Jesus is going to show you on, on the day that you stand at the judgment seat of Christ... Jesus will show you all the tests that you were given in your natural life. And he'll give you your personal test results. When you see yourself in the light of heaven without any natural pretense, or without any of your excuses that you make for your soul on earth, you will completely agree with the position that you earned. You will see the successes and the failures of your soul throughout this life. You'll see them. And you will agree with the position that he gives you. How many are okay with that? Look at Mark chapter 10. I am so excited. Like, my natural vision is getting worse. Like I could have Mr. Magoo glasses when I read now. But I'm thankful because my spiritual vision is changing. And I'm just thankful for that. How many want their spiritual vision to change? Doesn't matter if you're completely blind naturally, if your spiritual vision's sharp. Amen? When he was gone forth into the way, there came one running and kneeled to him. And he said, good master, what shall I do that I might inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, why do you call me good? There's no one good but God. You know the commandments. Don't commit adultery. Don't kill. Don't steal. Don't bear false witness. Defraud not. Honor your father and your mother. And he answered and he said unto him, Master, all these have I observed from my youth. Then Jesus beholding him loved him. And he said unto him, One thing you lack. Go your way. Sell whatever you have. Give it to the poor. And you shall have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross and follow me. And he was sad at the saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. How many have ever heard this story before? Everything that happened in Jesus' life has spiritual truth that has to be gleaned from it. Jesus' life was spiritual truth, whether it was a, a natural encounter or a spiritual encounter. It all has spiritual truth that we have to glean from it. So here's a real-life parable, 
And this guy is who we call the rich young ruler, right? The rich young ruler. How many understand that there are types all through Scripture? There are types. The rich young ruler, you have to look at him as a type. You can't look at him as a person. You have to look at him as a type. This young man comes running to Jesus. The word running is prostreco. It means with great exuberance, with great energy, and with great excitement. <clears throat> How many here heard about the Savior's love? And you heard about his mercy? And you heard about his ability to forgive and to change a life? And you surrendered to him with great excitement? How many remember the great excitement that you gave your heart to Christ and the way you felt brand new? Isn't this the way that every love story begins? You hear about something that's almost too good to be true and you enter it with great excitement and great anticipation. Why? Because you found the pearl of great price, didn't you? The field full of treasure. And what happened? You couldn't stop thinking about it. How many remember when you met someone? Someone that you fell in love with and you couldn't stop thinking about them. There was something so special about that person and you couldn't stop thinking about them. It's the same thing. That's how every love story begins. Your love story with Jesus is no different. You found this, this treasure, this hidden treasure. But how many know that new brooms always sweep clean? My boss used to say that when we'd get a new employee. Say, man, that kid really works hard. He goes, new brooms always sweep clean. We'll wait for a couple weeks. We'll see what he's acting like. Then. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus and he basically asks this question. What can I do to please you? What can I do? What can I do? Tell me, Lord, do you need a missionary? I'll be one. Do you need someone to minister to great crowds? Of the unsaved, I'll do it. Do you want me to heal the sick and raise the dead? Cast out demons? I'm your boy, right? What do you want me to do, Lord? That's what he was. He was so ambitious. Isn't that awesome? Don't you love that ambition of, of brand new? And that ambition, they come to the job and they're hungry to work. It's just like this young man coming to Jesus. He's hungry. He says, Lord, what do you want me to do? What can I do? Look at verse 21 again. Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and he said to him, you lack one thing, go your way. Sell whatever you have. Give it to the poor, and you'll have treasure in heaven, and come, take up your cross, and follow me. <clears throat> I've heard a lot of sermons written about the rich young ruler and how many understand that ministers have judged this, this man and his response pretty harshly over the years when they read this and, and they judge him pretty harshly? But remember, this man is a spiritual type. And what's that mean? He's a type of all of us. He's a type of everyone. It's a spiritual parable. You've got to see this the way that the Lord sees it. We have to view this as a whole life scenario, not just a, a meeting with Jesus or a chance encounter one day. We have to see this as more than just something that briefly happened. But this young man coming to Jesus is an entire life scenario. And he comes to Christ with great enthusiasm, just like you. And he keeps the rules and the commandments. Why? Because he desired to please God. He said, keep the commandments. And he said, I did, I have. Why did he do that? Why did he change his behavior? There's only one reason. Why did you change your behavior? How many wanted to please God? So there were things that you said, I don't want to do that anymore. Why? Because I love him. And I don't want to hurt him. So you find your behavior change. Is that true? It's absolutely true. He keeps the rules. He keeps all the commandments. And what's his next big thing? He desires to do great things for God, doesn't he? Give me more that I can do besides just be good. I want to do things for you. I want to do things, eternal things for your kingdom. 
So Jesus looks at him, just like he looks at you. And he said, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross, follow me. Those are hard words, right? How many don't want to... We just want to imagine it's this guy. How many know this guy lived at a standard way below what you do? They called him rich then, but he wasn't rich compared to you. Compared to our society. Just wasn't. So we like to think of him as this wealthy king that, you know, was greedy or something was wrong. But that's not what Jesus is talking about. He says, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, take up your cross, follow me. This is the path to heavenly treasure, a.k.a. eternal reward. Remember, everything in your life is being tested because you're interviewing for an eternal position. Your life here is an interview for an eternal position. We want to see. Here's what we need to know. The way you believe and the way that God sees things is generally never the same. Why? Because your heart is deceitful and polluted. How many believe that? You don't want to believe that, but it's true. God said it. How many know if God said it, it's true? I don't want to believe it, but it's true. My heart is deceitful. If God said your heart's deceitful, then I got to go, yeah, well, I believe you. I don't believe my heart that tells me it's not. Right? God said the heart is deceitful. So we can't see it the way God sees it because God sees it through God eyes. I see it through a deceitful, polluted heart. And he says it's incurably sick and it's weak and it's frail. What is Jesus saying to this believer? He's a believer. He represents you. He represents me. He represents the body of Christ. What is Jesus saying to this believer who's kept all the rules of Christianity? That's what this parable is. Here's a young man who's kept all the rules of Christianity, and now he wants to be used mightily by God. How many have ever wanted to be used mightily by God? Right? Don't we all? So what does Jesus say to him? Humble yourself. Look at verse 22. And he was sad at the saying, and he went away grieved, for he had great possessions. He was sad. Stugnadzo, sad. The word literally translates, he was depressed and he was discouraged and he found the words that Jesus was saying to him odious. He didn't want anything to do. They were unacceptable. Extremely unpleasant words, unacceptable. My soul doesn't want to hear that. Humble yourself. I don't want to hear that. Humble yourself. I said to Carol, I said, you know, we need to do something specific every day to humble our soul specifically like what whatever God tells you to reach out to somebody pray with somebody volunteer to teach Sunday school class how many know nobody wants to teach little kids it's beneath you it is it's beneath you do you know how I started teaching Sunday school class to little kids when I was in my 30s in my 30s Teaching Sunday school class. And you know what I taught like? I taught like I was an evangelist. I would have kids come to the altar weeping, giving their hearts to Christ. Jesus said, humble yourself. We don't like to humble ourselves. Like that. that's, that's, that's how some like I want to do. Right? Humble yourself. Jesus said that. He's talking to us. He's talking to the body of Christ. He says, if you want to be great, humble yourself. If you want to impress me, humble yourself. But the Bible says he heard these words and it was unacceptable and it made him depressed and sad and discouraged. He found the words unpleasant. And he went away grieved. He was distressed, Lupeo. 
So then which part of this man do you suppose caused him to be depressed and discouraged and distressed? Would it have been his spirit or his soul? Your spirit's never depressed. It's always your soul. Your soul's the part that gets angry. Your soul's the part that gets jealous. Your soul's the part that gets uh, proud. Your soul's the part that all that you deal with is in your soul. It's all the ugly parts. It's in your soul. It said, when I stand in front of God, I want to be, <coughs> excuse me, innocent. He said, I don't want to commit the great transgression, which is presumptuous sin. How many know what presumptuous means? It's the word zaid in the Hebrew, and it means arrogant, proud, and, the, and it means also to presume. To presume lacks fear, and it lacks honor. When I am proud, I lack the fear of God. To presume is to suppose or to take for granted that something is true. Presumption brings forth confident, demanding, entitled generation of Christians. David wrote, cleanse me from my secret. Root out and destroy. The word secret is my hidden self. Root out and destroy the desires of my hidden self, visions of grandeur, delusions even of grandeur. The hidden self is the heart that Jeremiah said was polluted and desperately wicked. One of the great presumptions of Christianity is that your salvation experience changed your wicked heart into one that was as pure as the driven snow. How many have ever heard that? People say, you know, my heart changed, and it didn't. That's a presumption. You don't understand. You believe it did. But your soul is still has that same desire, that same need, that same uh, ambition. <clears throat> David wasn't referring to a heart that was hidden from other people. He was talking about a, his heart that was hidden from himself. That's what he said. I want to see what my heart looks like through your eyes, God. How many want to see what their heart looks like to God? How many know it's, it's hard to see? You don't know your own heart. And you don't know all that it holds that's offensive to God. Look at Matthew 4. Now when Jesus had heard that John was cast into prison, he departed to Galilee. And leaving Nazareth, he came and he dwelt in Capernaum, which is upon the seacoast in the borders of Zabulon and Naphtali, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, <clears throat> the land of Zebulun and Naphtali, by the way of the sea beyond Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people which sat in darkness saw great light, and to them which sat in the region in shadow of death, light has sprung up. And from that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How many know that the word of God is eternal? How many know that Jesus is still preaching this message? The message for the church today is repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The message for every believer, every person that calls themselves a believer is repent. The kingdom of heaven is, is, is at hand. The word repent in the Greek means to continually change positions through the receiving of understanding. You know, there's people that, that still believe exactly like they did in the, you know, 40 and 50 years ago. There's nobody that, that is following Christ that still believes the same that they did 40 years ago. Nobody that's following Christ does. There are people who are following Christianity that still believe the same as they did 40 years ago, but not people who are following Christ. Understanding is spiritual. How many know that? What does that mean? You can't receive it through thought, but only through revelation knowledge. How many know that all your thinking is carnal? All your thinking comes from your heart, comes from your soul. 
The spirit doesn't think. The spirit man hears God. It's your soul, your thoughts. How many have ever been wrong in your thoughts, right? Right? Why? Because our soul is so polluted. It's so deceived and it's so polluted. So you can't receive revelation knowledge through your soul. It has to come by the spirit. Your entire life is to be filled with the pursuit of repentance. Every day you are to be desperately seeking to see differently. Every day. That's what growing is. Only Pharisees have no heart for repentance. Pharisees refuse to believe or admit that their hearts are anything but good. That's an amazing thought, isn't it? How many desire change? Look what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3. Seeing then that we have such great hope, we use great plainness of speech. And not as Moses, which put a veil over his face that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. <clears throat> but their minds were blinded. For until this day remained the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that spirit. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, we all, he must have been Southern, with open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. How many understand that religious pride will veil our eyes just like it has the Jewish people? It does exactly the same to Christians. Remember he said that, that the Jewish people's eyes were veiled, that they don't see. They will see someday, but they don't see yet. Religious pride does the same thing to Christians. It will veil their eyes so that they can't see the spiritual things. It's what Paul was warning about. Our only potential to walk in continual repentance is to have the veil removed. He said that the veil is only removed, how? In Christ. How many believe that? How many understand that in Christ and in Christianity are not the same thing? It's not. It's two different things. Paul said, in Christ, I am changed spiritually. How? And then he says this. From revelation to increasingly progressive revelation. From glory to glory. That's what that translates. From revelation to increasingly progressive revelation. One of Christianity's great deceptions is that the deleting of my seen sins. How many can remember your seen sins? How many still struggle with seen sins once in a while, right? Not that we want anybody to see our seen sins, but we see them, right? But Christianity has convinced people that if they delete their seen sins, it makes them more Christ-like. This is false. This is false. How many understand that it doesn't take any type of revelation whatsoever to know what your seen sins are? How many could steal something and you wouldn't have to have a revelation from God that you had sinned. It doesn't take any spiritual revelation to know when you sin your seen sins, does it? Not at all. He's talking about the unseen part that he's here to change. Your unseen heart, the part of you that he sees as ambitious and proud. That part, that's the part, the part that hates to be humbled, that despises the words, humble yourself. Look at Luke 18. And he spoke this parable under certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and they despised others. There's a verse, isn't it? It literally translates, they were confident and fully persuaded that their hearts were holy and innocent before God. And this caused them to view others as less than themselves. They looked at people and they categorized them. I'm not sure how, what level of Christian that person is. The only way that you can make that judgment is from a proud heart. 
Because you don't see your own heart. You just see your good behavior and you think that's what God is looking at. But he's looking at your heart. God's checking out your heart. How many are okay with me so far? Jesus said, uh, why religious? And he's talking about the religious. And he says, why the religious Pharisees think this way? Look at verses 10 and 11. Two men went up into the temple to pray. The one was a Pharisee, the other was a publican. The Pharisee stood and he prayed thus with himself. God, I thank you that I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. Look at this guy. I don't, he's judging him. He doesn't even know him. How many know that all these things that he mentions, he says here, I'm not an extortioner, I'm not unjust, I'm not an adulterer. How many know that all the things that he mentions are seen sins? It's what he mentions. He says, thank you, God, that I don't have the same seen sins that these people do. That my sins are invisible to the world. He mentions seen sins. I've gotten rid of all my seen sins. The seen sins change with the generations, but the results remain the same. His hidden heart, his hidden heart, this part, remember the, the part that's deceptive? The hidden heart? His heart believes that getting over all my seen sins have allowed me to attain the high ground of God's favor from whence I can now judge all those who struggle with seen sins. Isn't that amazing? Then look what his secret heart thinks in verse 12. He said, I fast twice a week. I give tithes of, that, of all that I possess. This is as he begins his religious duty list. He has a list. How many have a list? Maybe yours is more charismatic or Pentecostal. I pray in tongues for hours a day. I listen to worship music throughout the day. I read my Bible for hours a day. And you know what this proves? It proves that God favors me. I do all these seen things. All these obvious things. But look at the position of the publican's heart in, in verse 13. The publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes to heaven, but he smote upon his breast and he said, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I love this guy. You know, <clears throat> we would like to believe that the tax collector is standing afar off because he reeks of alcohol and cheap perfume. Right. We want to categorize him as bad as we can. So we think the worst. How many, you know, you're a sinner, so we got to think the worst. Why? Because it makes me feel better about me. And maybe it's true. Maybe he does. But maybe he's just looking at his own life in contrast with the glory and the splendor of Almighty God. Maybe this guy's just had a revelation of God. And he's looking at his heart. Maybe there's no seen sin. Maybe it's just the fact that he sees what he actually looks like in comparison to God. How many compare yourself to sinners easier than you compare yourself to God? Right? It's easier, right? Maybe God came by the Spirit and he revealed this hidden, polluted, in <clears throat> incurably sick heart to this man. Maybe he's aware of his inward pride and the critical way that he views others. And that very revelation causes him to repent again. Maybe he's just repenting again. He sees what he literally looks like, what his heart truly looks like, and he's repenting again. While the Pharisee's heart is self-exalting and smug, and his eyes are arrogantly dry, the publican sees his self, like Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 1 when he says, I see myself as the chief of sinners. Can you imagine the apostle Paul said that? This is years after he's become a believer. And he said, I see myself as the chief sinner. 
I know what my heart looks like because God revealed it to me. I see my pride. I see my arrogance. I see envy. I see the things that nobody else sees, but God in his mercy has allowed me to see. How many really want to please God? Start praying that he would show you what your heart looks like. Not what your actions look like, but what your heart looks like. <clears throat> How many know that most Christians like to brag about what great sinners they were in their day? But you know what? In all my time as a believer, I've heard very few who would ever humbly admit that their heart is prone to pollution. If you don't see yourself as this publican, then you have been religiously blinded and you've never experienced the true pre presence of God. You know, God visits me on occasion, like, and a lot of times it's in the middle of the night, <clears throat> which is terrifying. And he and I need to talk about that. So it's not good for my heart. <clears throat> but he'll visit me sometimes in the middle of the night and the terror of God and his holiness and, his, and that beauty of his presence is overwhelming. And it makes me realize how ugly my heart does look. And I repent again. And I cry out again that God would purge my heart, purify my heart. How many understand that even angels who have never sinned cover themselves with their wings in the presence of God. You know why? Because God's glory is so amazing that it makes everything appear filthy in His presence. How could I ever be arrogant enough to believe that just being a good Christian and keeping the rules is enough to please this holy, terrifying God. The story told by Jesus is not to be seen as an event. It must be seen as a lifetime reality. This story of the publican and the Pharisee, because you know why? Sometimes my heart is the Pharisee. Every one of us have been in the place where that's been us. But how many know that God wants us in a place where we look more like the publican, where we're broken in his presence? Look at this last verse in Luke 18. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone that exalts himself will be abased and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. <clears throat> this man, this always broken and humble sinner, the Bible says he went home. How many noticed that? Down to his house. You know what that's talking about? It's talking about eternity. When it says he went down to his house, it's talking about he went home. Whether he died or the Lord came, but he went home. And he went home justified. He went home justified. The word means innocent, free, and righteous. You know why he, went, he got to go home into eternity, innocent, free, and righteous? Because he saw his true heart in the light of God's glory. And the Bible says he humbled himself. Every day, every day. This is why you search for the presence of God. This is why just reading your Bible and, and saying a few prayers isn't enough. This is why every day you must search desperately for the presence of God. Because every time you find the presence of God, He reveals your heart to you. And you have the opportunity. How many know in eternity you're not going to have an opportunity to repent? And you have an opportunity to repent. And God reveals it to you. That's mercy. How many understand that? That that's what mercy looks like. God loves you enough 
that in this life he's giving you that opportunity because soon you're going to go home. And you're going to be judged according to what your position in the kingdom will be. And God loves the humble. He loves them enough to give them grace, divine influence. But the proud, he holds at a distance. I don't know about you, but least in the kingdom could potentially mean those that are the greatest distance away from God. How many don't want that? How many don't want to be one of those who Jesus said, you know what? I can't really, you know, deal with your pride and arrogance. So why don't you just go over there about as far as you can go and you just stay over there. I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that's so close to him in the kingdom that I annoy him. You know, what do you want me to do now? What do you want me to do now? Right? Don't you want to be that close? I think those are the great in the kingdom. The greatest position is absolutely. What could be a greater position than to be close to the king? How many want to be great in the kingdom? We used to sing a song. If you want to be great in the kingdom of God, you learn to be a servant. How many remember that song from the 70s and 80s we sang it? You want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. Do you know what it takes to serve people that you find naturally hard to be around. I mean, it's easy to serve people that you like, isn't it? It's easy. Jesus said there's no reward for serving those you like. Your reward is serving those that are a little bit hard to tolerate, hard to deal with. The kingdom is at hand. You need to know this today. The kingdom is at hand. This is your only chance to repent. Seek his presence this week, desperately, like you've never sought his presence before, until he comes and reveals himself to you. Because it's the only potential you have for your heart to change. Getting rid of all your bad seen sins was a great thing. Congratulations. But it's the heart that needs to be purged of all the hidden things. David said, Show me my hidden heart that I would not have presumptuous, proud sin before you. Amen. Stand with me if you would. Father, we just, we're thankful that you teach us and that you are merciful to show us God, I, I just am so thankful today. I'm thankful that you're merciful to your body, to the church. And Father, I pray that this week that we would seek you more diligently than we did this past week. That we would dedicate more time, that we would humble ourselves every chance we get. Lord, <clears throat> I don't have a suggestion or a list, but that we would come to you and say, how would you have me to humble myself for you? Lord, that you would show us how you would have us to humble ourselves this week. That you might be glorified and that we might be made lower. Father, we want to serve you. We ask that you would come and judge our heart and reveal it to us so that we might be purged and purified in your presence. For our longing is to please you, O oh God. Hallowed be thy name, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all.